This is Duke University. On January 4, 2008, when the military and SWAT police forces descended upon Rambo Advaisho, a black coastal community in the center of Brazil's northeastern city of Salvador, I ran for cover into the bathroom of the home of neighborhood activist Ana Cristina. Crouched near the sink, I listened to the sounds of terror as the police invaded an entire neighborhood. I heard the women screaming as they closed doors and windows, policemen and policewomen threatening to kill, and masked men pushing, in, uh, pushing unsuspecting victims onto the ground of the narrow street. Latin America and the Caribbean have the largest concentration of people with African ancestry outside of Africa up to 70% of the population in some countries. The region imported over 10 times as many slaves as the US. Given that history, it is amazing that the incredible contribution that millions of people of African descent have had on the history and culture of Latin America and the Caribbean is often forgotten or ignored. There are 150 million African descendants in Latin America and the Caribbean. And although they make up uh, up to one third of the region's population, they comprise nearly 50% of the region's poor population. The children's screams accompanied their mothers and fathers pulling them out of the ocean. Divers and fishermen and fishermen desperately trying to paddle or swim to shore, and helicopters flying low, nearly touching the rooftops. Rapid gunfire that cracked roof tiles alerted residents of the invasion in the first place, which, as one woman said, confused her as to whether they were from bandidos, meaning bandits, bandits, or policiais, the police. The blood on the ground was still fresh. In some Latin American countries, such as Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia, visibility for African descent is a major challenge. According to John Salgado, representative of the NGO Oro Negro and the Chilean Alliance for Afro-Descendant Organizations, he says, quote, there is an invisibilization of our ethnicity. It is impossible to acknowledge problems when you don't see the people who are suffering them, end quote. The divide stemming from 500 years of racism distances us from the rest of society in terms of access to skilled employment and to secondary and tertiary education. The practice of racism is so embedded in people's subconscious that it is very hard to raise awareness and to deconstruct it. At one point during the police raid, Anna Christina looked at me kneeling on the bathroom floor with my head in my hand and said, Koitara Kisha Khan, which translates to me, poor Kisha Khan. I immediately felt embarrassed because I wondered if she could read my thoughts of my packing my bags and running back to central Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> My voice shaken, I looked at Anna Christina and responded, no, with Dalji noise, for us. The police siege held residents of Gamboa de Baixo hostage between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Anna Christina immediately replaced her kitchen door with a concrete wall and delicately told me that if I wanted to leave her home in the neighborhood, she and the other women would understand. As a Jamaican-born, U.S.-based black woman, I came face to face with my privilege and realized that although I had a choice to leave, where would I go? No black neighborhood in, in Salvador, or the African diaspora for that matter, as we look at the recent case of Trayvon Martin, was immune to violence, specifically police violence. Who would protect me in another neighborhood in the city above the Gustodor Avenue? For more than a decade, I have focused my ethnographic research on land and housing rights in Salvador's poorest neighborhoods, where black men and women are the constant target of violence by uh, drug traffickers, private and military police, and I'd like to emphasize private and military police, and state development agencies. That morning of the police raid in Gamboa de Baixa, I had to ask myself, why bother carry out ethnographic research amidst violence if, you, if I curl up on the floor and do nothing? How should I make sense of my ethnographic commitment to theorizing human rights and collaboration when I am held captive mentally and physically and collective silence becomes a law? <coughs> In the midst of a police raid, when my unwillingness to move, much less pick up a camera or a notebook, the dilemma of my being an anthropological witness overwhelmed me. In the classroom, what I try to do is shift between examining structural conditions and agency. So really getting students to understand why, if you look at contemporary societies, blacks still continue to be marginalized in popular politics, are overrepresented in the prison system, 
book began with slavery and to understand how assumptions about racial inferiority have continued throughout the 20th century and into present day. During my junior year of college, I studied abroad in Havana, Cuba. As an African American, I had and mainly do identify as a black person or an African American woman rather than being just an American. Um, conversely, almost all of the Cuban women of color I interviewed identified as Cuban women first and black or mulatto second. Many of them assertively articulated this identification, perhaps as a critique of African American scholars and their interpretations of Cuban racial ideologies and race relations. This became a pivotal moment for me. It elucidated that, in addition to markers such as race, gender, class, and religion, the nation has played a vital role in Afro-diasporic Afro identity formation in the Americas. As well as thinking about a global black community and the ways in which we're linked, but also shared differences throughout the Americas, including Latin America. And in the process, challenging students to think about race and blackness in a way that decenters the African American experience as the black experience in the world. Finally, by acknowledging that the histories of people of African descent, including Afro-Latin Americans, are importantly a part of the history of black communities in the United States, including HBCUs. Invariably, the struggles of black communities throughout Latin America have centered on recognition, identity, racialization and racism, dispossession, recovery, and preservation of culture, exclusion, and on and on. These are not new conditions, but for the first time in history, the histories of their struggles have been linked up with, with, uh, with those of other African descended communities in the Americas, providing for fresh approaches to methodology and praxis in the moment. In fact, let me, let me back off and say a couple of things. Um, particularly in the United States, many African Americans began to talk more about their relationship to Africa um, through or being able to touch it through the notion that there were struggles going on uh, in that part of the world. Um, by and large, the promise that Africa held out for leading um, a diasporic uh, resurgence um, was not realized, if you will. That the fact that the state in Africa has sunk into a little bit of what I would call uh, a neoliberal, neocolonial framework means that it is no longer for most African Americans and for many people in the diaspora a place that you look to for the political advancement about ideas in the diaspora. It still remains in many ways a fictive home, but at least in terms of the political touchstone, you don't see that in the continent today. Um, I keep hearing you guys use this word identity, and I'm wondering about the concept of ethnicity and how it relates to the way we perceive the African diaspora. At times we try to, we, we end up creating these binaries and I don't necessarily think that they're altogether realistic or fair. And also the fact that there are people who are um, Afro-Latino, um, who are lighter skinned, who self-identify as black and participate in struggle from that vantage point. And a lot of what I'm hearing here is coming from the one angle of the person whose skin color is black and not enough about the person who may not, on the physical plane, look black but self-identifies and participates as such. I'm very careful to, um, to most oftentimes go with how people identify themselves. Right, regardless of their skin tone and so forth. You tell me you're black, you're black, I'm not gonna ask you, you know, well, show me the, the paperwork. Um, so, um, but the, one of the things that I find really fascinating is that at the, time, at the same time that people are critiquing um, identity policy or saying that, you know, you're, you're using these very fixed notions of identity to talk about Afro-Brazilians, um, for example, and talk about anti-black police abuse and, and uh, forced displacement. At the same time, they also ask, but don't, aren't there only 50% of the, you know, Aren't there all these color gradations to talk about Afro-Brazilians? 
One, there's uh, at least 50% of the Brazilian population identifies on paper as black. So we'll take that as a given regardless of what the other 50% do or do not do. That's 50% of 180 million. That's a significant black population to have to deal with in terms of grappling with the inequalities, right? Um, so that's something to keep in, uh, keep in mind. The other part of it, he says, is that even if there were 1%, it was only 1% of the population that self-identified as black, that 1%, like in the U.S. it's only 18%, it's not 50%, that 1% also has the right to achieve access to education, good quality housing, and so forth. So I think that, um, not to say that I'm shifting away from discussion around how people identify, but I'm also suggesting that regardless of the number, uh, these, you know, regardless of the quantity, uh, folks have the right to a, a good quality of life. In the case of Afro-Cuban women, for example, they're constantly moving between different social movements to obtain access to new resources and different institutions. And so I acknowledge the ways in which in some cases it is based on their racial identity, but sometimes it's about anti-imperialism, it's about anti-capitalism, and you really need to take into account all those different forms of political participation to understand how they view um, liberation and social equality. I just wanted to add, um, just one quick thing, as long as the police um, knows who's black, I'll continue to use the term black in my own. So, as long as they can identify black people, I'll continue to use the, the, the definition of black. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.